I got one for you, man. You're gonna like it. <laughs> It's December of 1998 in Irvine, California, and Pete Terrio is taking care of his friend George Duncan, who's had one too many. God, victory! <laughs> all right, man, all right, don't wake up the whole neighborhood, okay? Don't wake up the whole neighborhood. All right, all right. All right. Pete Terrio is one of the most responsible, nicest guys. He believed in, in helping the others. <laughs> Just rest there, buddy. With any luck, George will go down without disturbing Pete's girlfriend, Judy, and her daughter who also lives there. You didn't have to wait up. I was worried about you. <laughs> He's in pretty rough shape. What if he crashes here? As long as he doesn't wake Tori. I appreciate it. Come to bed soon. You might get lucky. later, the night shift is just getting underway at the Ford plant in Commerce City, where both Pete and Judy work. It was basically a parts distribution center. Pete worked the night shift. He'd been working the night shift for years. On this particular night, he didn't show up. That was very unusual, very unusual for, yes. for Pete Terrio. Have you seen Peter? No. He's devoted to his job. He never missed a single day in his entire career. No. He worked constantly. He was somebody to depend on. And so the fact that he wasn't being dependable that particular day when he disappeared was a pretty big factor. Hours later, Pete is still a no-show. Hello? Judy, it's Joe. Is Peter there? No. He didn't show up for his shift. What? Peter's supervisor reaches out to Peter's live-in girlfriend, Judy. Judy is a forklift operator at the Ford plant. Peter, after he was divorced, started dating Judy in 1997, and just six months later, he moved Judy and her daughter in. Is everything okay? We had a little tiff around supper. He stormed off. She described an argument and said he'd driven away in his convertible. They fight every once in a while, and he always sleeps at a buddy's house. They usually kiss and make up. Judy starts calling Pete's friends, her friends, their acquaintances, co-workers. Nobody knows. No one's heard from him. 48 hours after learning that Pete had missed his shift at work, Judy calls the police. 911, what is your emergency? Uh, it's not an emergency, but uh, I need to report a missing person. All the people that knew him knew that something was dramatically wrong. Pete Terrio, at that point, literally has disappeared off the face of the earth. Detectives head over to the couple's home to take Judy Velott's report. From the beginning, who's missing? My boyfriend, mm -hmm. Peter Terrio. Describe Peter. Uh, Mid-50s, rugged, very handsome, super nice guy. Here's a photo of him. Really? What happened? We had a little argument about my daughter. Judy did have a daughter from a previous marriage who is about 13 or 14 years old at the time. She's just at that age, you know, she needs boundaries. And Peter just, well, he never draws the line. I mean, he's, he's great with her, don't get me wrong, but I'm always the bad cop. Anyway, it wasn't much of a spat, but he did drive off in a huff. Pete took off, he took off in his Mustang, and that's the last time Judy says, she, you know, she saw, she saw him. Now, what time was that? Around eight, two nights ago. Was your daughter here that night? She wore headphones and listened to music a lot, and that particular night, she had been wearing those and didn't hear the fight between her mom and Pete. He and I both work at the factory, but he didn't show up for work, which never happens. I feel so guilty. Okay, so tell us about him. He's very comfortable in his own skin. He was really a, kind of a man's man. He was an avid golfer, He'd hang out with his buddies. He had this convertible he would cruise around in. And it was something really special to him. It was a, a really nice one in great shape, and he loved it. <laughs> he liked to be outdoors, and Judy was also active and outdoorsy and liked to get outside, liked to go out to the desert. One of the great things about their relationship is they can spend a lot of time outdoors because Judy happens to have a trailer in Blythe, just 30 miles from the Arizona-California border where they spend a lot of time. They had pictures of them shooting guns together out in the desert. Fire when ready. One, two, three. He 
loved his guns. He had a fairly sizable collection. He took great care of them and was very meticulous with them. Good job, babe. He treats me wonderfully. And my daughter, like she's his own. Plus, you know, his mother, she lives up north. He's so attentive to her, constantly in touch. He's just the best. Do you know anyone who would wish him harm? Nobody. No, everybody loves him. Okay, um, do you mind if we look around? Please, you know, help yourself. Okay, thank you. Trained investigators are looking for signs of violence. There's nothing indicating that, that there's any wrongdoing at all. Uh, this is my daughter, Tori. These men are trying to find Peter. Were you home the night before last? Yes. You were here the whole night? I mean, I came home from school like now and then went to school the next morning. Sorry we had to ask. Did Peter serve in the military? Yeah, very proudly. Most of his buddies are army vets. A few of them suffer from PTSD, but Peter was always there for them. I don't know. Maybe he's just blown off some steam. In missing persons cases, 99 times out of 100, the person turns up, there's a, there's a saying in law enforcement, a uh, missing person is really only missing from the people that are trying to find them. You start out with a missing persons case that nine, nine times out of 10, there's no foul play at all. There's nothing even to be concerned about. The person's gonna show up hungover and embarrassed most of the time. But as the, as the police and detectives begin to learn about who Pete Terrio was, what a, what a devoted son he was, how devoted he was to his to his family that threw up some concerns for um, for some of the detectives typically in a missing persons case the police will call other surrounding uh, police precincts and towns and hospitals and and check accident reports uh, put out an APB for, for the car and that's what they do in this case they kind of cast a, a wide net to see could he have been in an accident could he have been arrested you know, did he take off somewhere and got drunk and was gambling or whatever. They just cast a wide net to see if there's any kind of report that would fit his description. He was angry. Maybe he was in a canyon somewhere driving fast and whoosh, off the road. In this case, that was something we looked at because he drove a fairly powerful car. And that would just be an accident that maybe hasn't been discovered. Not certain if Pete's disappearance is due to an accident or foul play. Detectives head to the plant, eager to hear if Pete's colleagues give him the same glowing reviews that Judy did. Was he acting normal the, before the night he didn't show? Yeah, normal as could be. He was busting my chops about the UCLA game. He knows I'm a big fan, and they lost. What about his relationship with Judy Ballot? It works. She's strong-willed. He's laid back. He really cared about her and her kid, and she's crazy about him. They never fought? The couple doesn't fight, but if they did, they didn't bring it here. Peter confide in anyone around here? His best buddy's Tex Mazzell. Tex. Tex. Is he, is he working today? Is he around? Yes. Yes, yeah. Okay. In any investigation like this, the, the police are going to be very uh, interested in, in work and work friends, and maybe it's related to work in some way. Maybe somebody there knows something. So uh, a person's place of employment is one of the first group of interviews that you know good investigators will conduct and when they got to the to the Ford facility they learned that Pete was not only um, incredibly responsible that he never missed a single day of work in what 20 years when we talked with the people at work um, he was highly thought of and he was uh, well respected and everybody thought that something was out of whack here because he wouldn't do this he wouldn't just not come to work because he always has so they were pretty much in the same belief that we had that something must have happened, otherwise he would not have uh, left work and not come back. So Tex, what do you make of the uh, disappearance of Peter Terrio? Strange, to mm -hmm. say the least. You talking about any problems he was having? No, everything's always easy breezy with Peter. Anybody have a grudge with Peter? Hell no, guy is the most likable dude ever. People that we spoke to that knew Pete just described him as cool-headed, um, kind of mild-tempered, and uh, and very responsible. He had no enemies. He had nobody that was mad at him. He never had a cross word with anybody. Everybody liked him. So far, police don't hear anything suspicious, and there's no real evidence of a crime. Still, cops consider the leads they do have. 
I'm still wondering about his army buddies. Huh. I mean, if you have PTSD, you can go off in a flash. And? What if Peter leaves in a huff? And he hopes to crash at an army buddies. Hey, man. What's up? I'm just, just trying to think about my greatest life achievements. Peter knows he's in tricky territory. I mean, he's, he's seen this before. People out there that care about you more than you know. Yeah, he might be right. That's to me. What are you kidding? You kidding? No, 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 no. You know what are you doing? What are you doing? And then he shoots Peter and gets rid of the body. Oh, no. No, 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 no. No, no. And that is where we are. So let's start calling his friends. See if we get anywhere. Maybe talk to Judy again. Yeah. Cops asked Judy for the names of veterans whom Pete had counseled recently. He wanted to help others, and he helped people with PTSD. He was, an, he was a good listener, and he was a person that was easy to talk to. He was particularly concerned about a veteran named George Duncan, who'd been drinking heavily. So when was the last time you saw Peter? I don't know. Three days, maybe? His girlfriend said you crashed on his sofa puked in her potted plant. Remember? I don't remember nothing. That's the whole point. So where were you three nights ago? Monday night. You don't remember. O'Malley's. Till closing time. Anybody vouch for you? Vinny. Vinny who? Vinny the bartender. Eddie? That's me. You know what George Duncan? Oh, jeez. What's he done now? Was he in here last Monday night? Yeah, afraid so. Really? Till when? Till I close up and kick this drunken ass out. What time was that? Two. Okay. So what do you think? You really could have met George after two. Or been waiting for him. And George is not the only army buddy of Peter's with emotional problems. So? So let's keep him on the burner, huh? Okay? Cops continue now? interviewing veterans until they get a call from Pete's friend Tex, who says he's remembered something that might be of use. Well, his mama has a place a couple hours out, Lake Elsinore. She doesn't live there anymore. She rents it, and the people that rent it are real gnarly. Peter complained about them all the time, total lowlifes. Come to think of it, he said he was headed up there real soon. Maybe you guys should check that out. This latest guy who was renting his mom's apartment, he thought was not only on drugs, but possibly manufacturing them and selling them out of the apartment. Maybe he went to the apartment to check on things at the wrong time and stumbled onto something that he shouldn't have. Come on in. When there's money and drugs, there's violence, and, you know, it's a, a recipe for murder. Five days after Pete Terrio goes missing in Southern California, detectives talk to Pete's mother about the rental property he helped her manage. She admits that she has rented to some wackos out there, but she needed the rent money, and Pete, she thought, had a handle on it. He was taking care of it. The tenant's name is Chuck Hammer. Detectives ride up to look for him in Lake Elsinore, about an hour's drive away. here yeah that's cold well maybe somebody picked him up maybe he's inside all right let's see what the neighbors think hello hi we're detectives with the Irvine Police Department working a missing persons case have you seen this man uh, that's Peter Theriot, Joyce's son. That's her house across the way. 
When did you see him last? A few weeks ago. He checks up on his uh, mother's place from time to time. So you didn't see him last Monday night? No, uh, I was with my sister in Pasadena. The people renting from the Terrios, you know them? It's one guy, unfriendly to say the least. Yeah, what's he do? Nothing good. There are sketchy people going in and out of that house all the time, mostly at night. Okay. Well, thank you, sir. Thank you. Bye. Yeah, that's Peter. Handsome fellow. And his black convertible? Oof. Have you seen Peter recently? Uh, maybe a month ago. He was having trouble collecting the rent. What about the guy they're renting it to? He's a vampire. Only comes out at night. Hmm. Have you spoken to him? I avoid him like the plague. Why? Because he looks like trouble. And the people coming in and out of the house, worse. What do you think they're doing in there? Who knows? In that particular area, there is there are some uh, druggies and drug users and drug dealers. Well, what do you want to do? Let's sit on the house. There's always a concern in situations like that that maybe there was some sort of dispute. At least from a situation where they're trying to figure out or anybody that might have a problem with Pete. I think this is a waste of time. No, I don't. Here's why. Peter's a model son. He's always taking care of his mother. So when the rent payment is late, he's on it. Hey, uh, I'm Peter Terrio. I'm Joyce's son. Uh, I came to look into the rent. I didn't receive. The check was late. Really? Yeah. Sent the check last week. Oh, well. Well, you know how the mail is, so, um... But then I drove all the way here. Can you write a new check? What about the old check? We'll just cancel it, and I'll deduct 20 bucks off the new check. Call it even. Okay. Just a sec. Trouble is, the check is always late, so Peter's always up here. I'm sick of coming up here. Last Monday, he drives up here. No one's home. He knocks at the door. He goes to the basement. Walks in. Chuck walks in. <laughs> what are you doing here? What are you doing here? It's drug den? Get out of here. You can't run drugs out of my mom's basement. But what? You know what? You got 24 hours. You need to move out. Now, for a minute, he thinks about bolting. But, you know, he's a stand-up guy. He doesn't want drugs being sold in his mother's home. 24 hours. Oh, what? You know what? You'll find out. Oh! I'm staying. Chuck gets rid of the body. End of story. There he is. Don't lose him. Detectives arrest Chuck Hammer and take him back to the precinct for questioning, then get a warrant to search the house. Recognize him? Yeah, Macho Man. <laughs> My landlady's son. When did you see him last? Two weeks. Maybe more. Why? You're sure you didn't see him Monday night? No way. Not him. He walked up to your house, and that was the last time he was seen. You guys are so full of it. <laughs> 
Well, we have a warrant, so we're gonna find what's ever in there. You know what you're gonna find? What? Drugs. Because that's my business, always has been. But you won't find anything else. Guaranteed. As detectives wait to hear what investigators find in the house, Pete's friend Tex stops by with another tip. So I, I was uh, thinking about what happened. And? Well, guy was a real chick magnet, like you wouldn't believe. So? So, well, I remembered a couple of weeks ago, the phone rang on the floor. Hello? Is Pete Terrio there? Well, he's, he's operating the forklift right now. Can I say who's calling? A friend. Okay. So I got Peter. He went to the phone. And I was walking by just as he was hanging up. Who was that? Nobody. But I could tell. He was shook up. What do you think happened? Crazy woman. You don't know who. The guy has a gift, so lots of candidates. Mm. He was a handsome man. He was healthy. Uh, he was very active. Women liked him. So therefore, the possibility of Pete having an affair is certainly there. Peter Terrio has been missing for five days, and his friend Tex just hinted to police that Pete may have been having an affair. Detectives run their theory by Judy Vallott, Pete's live-in girlfriend. It's true. Peter had a lot of lady admirers. Pete is not just a man's man. He is a woman's man. And one of the things that makes him so attractive is he has absolutely no idea how good looking he is. That was really the reason behind our fight. Judy, when they go talk to her again, she gets upset and she breaks down and starts crying and then she admits to the detectives at that point that she she wasn't 100 percent uh, forthright before they weren't arguing about her daughter they were arguing about judy thought that he was cheating on her so what happened somebody kept calling the house and just hanging up hello keeps calling and hanging up. Do you know anything about that? Peter acted like he didn't know who it was, but I sensed it was another woman. Women throw themselves at him. It doesn't matter to them that he has a girlfriend. They are attracted to Peter like moths to a flame. No idea who it might be? Okay, so we'll, we'll be in touch. It's a whole new angle for investigators to consider. So what do you think? You know, according to Tex, and now Judy, it's pretty obvious Peter might have strayed. Precisely. Here's what I think happened. Great. Is she on the wrong side? <laughs> no, I'm right where I belong. But then guilt sets in. I love this. Me too. But it's not over. At least not in Janet's mind. Hey, Janet, listen, uh... I, I can't keep doing this anymore. It's, it's not fair to, to Judy and her kid. But I, I don't care about them. I care about us. Janet, it's over. We're done. But all is not forgiven. Because in Janet's mind, she can't have Peter. No one can. I 
told you we were through. What's the matter with you? Look, I, I know you were right. I'm, I'm sorry. I. Can you sit down? I'll make us some drinks. Cheers to me forgiving you and you forgiving me. Drink to that. So who would know if Peter screwed around? Well, he was married before. The ex would know. When he got divorced, uh, his wife remained one of his closest friends, which is, uh, I mean, if there's a statement of somebody's character, I think that's probably it. So why'd you and Peter get divorced? We were both young and careless. So who fooled around? We both did. We lived, frankly, to regret it, but no really good friends. But what about him and Judy? What did he tell you? When you're an ex, you talk a lot, but you don't say much, especially a guy like Peter. Any idea who might wish him harm? Nobody. It's another dead end. Detectives can't seem to catch a break. There's no smoking gun. There's no witness that sees this. There's no physical evidence apparent. Pete is still missing, and as the days go by, it becomes the, the mystery gets darker and darker, but there's no break in the case. <sighs> What are we missing? Besides Peter? Yeah. His car. Yeah, he loved that car. Maybe he put a GPS on it or something. Let me make some calls. He loved that car so much that he installed a low jack tracking system inside that automobile. All right. Thanks so much. There you go. We got lucky. We found the car. Fantastic. The car shows up only three miles away from where Peter lived with Judy. The convertible top was up. The car was locked. The alarm was set on the car. The keys are, um, are not in the ignition. It doesn't look like the locks of the car have been messed with. They don't see any blood evidence. They don't see anything in disarray around the car. We did make note that uh, whoever had it had to have turned off the ignition and locked it with the key. Hey, officer, do you know who uses this parking lot? Oh, it's for the residents of the apartment, uh, apartment complex right across the street there. Thank you. In every missing persons investigation that turns into a murder case, there's that, there's that turning point. In this particular case, it was the location of P. Terrio's car. There's nothing terribly amiss, and they're about to leave the scene when it's, that an astute detective notices the position of the seat. Oh, man, this someone really short driving this car. The driver's seat is pushed all the way up as if somebody much shorter than Pete Theriot had driven that car. And there's no way he could have driven that car with the seat as far forward as it was. Maybe Pete wasn't the last person to drive that car. Now, police want to know if any of the residents has seen Pete on the property. Do you live in this apartment complex? Yes. Have you seen this man? He drives convertible in that parking lot. No, afraid not. You seen this man? Take a good look. No, I've never seen him. He doesn't appear to know anybody there. None of his friends live there. While uniformed officers continue interviewing, detectives head back to the station to meet another of Pete's colleagues who has come forward. I, we're the detectives handling the Peter Terrio case, and uh, you wanted to see us. Yes, I work in the assembly plant with both Peter and Judy, and... I like Peter. I mean, everybody does, but Judy? Judy thought I was after him, which is crazy. Heidi basically says 
Judy confronted her multiple times, believing that they were having an affair, and it got so bad that the union had to get involved and tell Judy, you gotta knock this off. She confronted me time and time again. You stay away from Pete, you hear me? What? Don't you dare give me that innocent look. I know exactly what you're doing. I played that game. But guess what? Pete's mine. And if you try to cross me with him, you're finished. You hear me? Done. She basically stalked me, threatened me until I complained to the union and they basically told her to back off. She scared the hell out of me. When people are, are being interviewed, you can tell the quality of somebody's story. A lot of times just by their affect and the way they speak and she was very convincing that nothing took place between her and Pete. Thank you for coming in, miss. Thank you. Okay, good luck. Back at the car, detectives have called in a canine unit to see if the dog can lead them to Pete. They decided to scent a bloodhound on the interior of the car in the hopes that Pete walked maybe in one of the apartment units. This particular dog was a people finder. And the dog took off and did not go into the apartment anywhere, ended up turning and going to the main street. The dog went to the street that uh, Judy and Pete lived on, three miles away. We found Peter's car. And the bloodhound found you. He actually alerted on Judy, which meant that's consistent with Judy, had been the one that had driven that car. That is the eureka moment. So now in the minds of the investigators, the suspicion that maybe Pete Terrio met with foul play and that Judy Vallot was not being honest with investigators it has a whole new dimension to it. But at that, at that point, you know, you can't call a bloodhound to testify. So where was the car? in the Thompson apartment complex. Three miles away. Her very first response was to angrily suggest, well, he, he must be having an affair with some woman that lives in the apartment complex. You gotta go knock on some doors there and find out what little hussy Pete was with over there. Did you go door to door before you pulled that little stunt with the mutt? No, we didn't. We didn't have to. They're not gonna tell her everything they know. They decide to set up a ruse. A ruse basically is legal in the state of California for a police officer to provide information to a criminal suspect in order to test their veracity. Authorities tell Judy that a tenant got really sick and tired of his car being broken into so many times, so he bought a cheap surveillance camera and set it up on his balcony and pointed that camera at the parking lot. The camera happened to be pointed at the same direction as the red Mustang, and that the camera captured on candid camera the last person who drove Peter's car, and that that person looked an awful lot like Judy. See, there was this guy who parked his car right next to Peter's parking space. And this poor guy, somebody was always breaking into his car. And he was very upset. So he put a surveillance camera right above his car so we could see. And lucky for us, that camera saw who parked Peter's car in his space, got out, locked it up, and left. You'll never guess who it was. It's either you or your twin sister. <laughs> I'm betting you have a twin sister. He says no way. Okay. I don't think so. Okay. Who's right? Okay, here's what happened. The night we had that fight, you know, about his infidelities. He walked off on foot. I was angry with him. So I took his car, and I drove it to that apartment complex. I parked it, and I walked back home. I was hoping somebody would steal it. So that's your story? That's what happened. It's the truth. The detectives now have a suspect, and that suspect is Judy. They thank her for her time, and they say they'll be in touch, but then they put her under surveillance, 24-hour surveillance. Let's nail her. Agreed. Now, Detectives are not the only ones who are suspicious of Judy. Hey, detectives, deja vu. What? There's another woman here to see you. Who? 
Mindy Franklin. She says she's a friend of Peter Terrio. Who is it? Thank you. Uh, it's Franklin. We're the detectives handling the Peter Terrio case. <sighs> Peter, Peter, Peter. Oh, she's, uh, there's no smoking, by the way. I've been in Maui. Uh, I heard about Pete going MIA. How do you know? We're drinking buddies since high school. <laughs> Confidants, as you might say. Well, what did he confide? Judy. <laughs> She's consumed by that green-eyed monster called jealousy. How bad was it? He wanted out. You have any idea where Peter might be? The desert? In Blythe? Judy's got a trailer out there. I went out there last year with the both of them to shoot. Thanks for coming in. Thanks for coming. Well, well, well. What now? I think it's time to talk to the DA. It's a rude awakening for Judy when detectives head back to her home with warrant in hand. It's a warrant to search the premises. Judy. She's told one too many lies. A week after Pete Terrio goes missing, detectives have a warrant to search the home he shares with Judy Vallott and her daughter. We were looking for any evidence of blood, if Pete had been shot with one of his guns, that would be something that we would expect blood to be in the house. Hey, detectives. What's up? I got a hit. I got a trail of blood. There is a, a very clear trail of blood drops leading out of the bedroom and into the garage. That's when th things begin to, to look dark. Police also find evidence of blood on Pete's pickup truck, parked in the garage. The lab came out to the house and uh, looked at the truck, and we found things consistent with blood on the tailgate of the truck, in the garage, on the garage floor where the truck was parked. Detectives head out to the trailer Judy owns in the desert, about three hours away. We got search warrants for her property out near Blythe. A hundred and... 50 years ago, that was prime gold mining country. So all throughout the, the, the California desert, there are holes dug everywhere from these old gold miners. That is a very popular place to go and bury murder victims. Investigators hope against hope that Pete might still be alive. But once they arrive on the site, there's no sign of Pete on the property, except for his weapons. Inside the trailer, we found his guns. Every one of Pete's firearms were meticulously cared for, and they were all stored in a, in a safe position without any ammunition, without any clips loaded. And the Sig Sauer was missing two rounds, and it had not been rendered safe. It was a live firearm. All right, let's get this over the ballistic. The magazine was out, but there was a bullet in the chamber, which is not the way Pete kept his gun. So somebody used that gun, not Pete. Next to the trailer, there's a shed, and in that shed, the detectives find a military-style shovel with dirt on its edge. Let's bag this, too. But at that point, it begins to become increasingly clear that Pete Terrio has met with some sort of foul play. Good morning, ma'am. We're investigating a missing person. Do you know your neighbor, Judy Fallon? Oh, well, sure. When was the last time you saw her? She was driving her ATV with a little trailer on the back of it over the hills. Did you happen to see what was in the trailer that she was pulling? Looked like garbage to me. Detectives pay Judy one final visit. What? What is it now? Judy Villot, you're under arrest. Are you nuts? Put your hands behind what? your back. I, I Put your hands behind I your back. I didn't do it! It's the murder of Peter Terrio. Are you crazy? Yeah, crazy. My daughter, Tori. Tori! Come I'll get on. her. I didn't do it! Come on. Pete's body is never found, making the district attorney's job that much harder. Will a jury be convinced that this man is, is dead as opposed to just missing? That can be a challenge. 
Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, Pete Terrio was loved by everybody. He opened up his big heart to the defendant, Judy Vallott, and her 13-year-old daughter, Tori, who he really treated as his own. And how did the defendant return that special love? With jealous, perverted rage that erupted into cold-blooded murder. I can smell her from here. You know what? We're done. You and I are done. All right, tomorrow you just need to move out. You need to find your own place because we're done. Liar! Now the evidence in this case showed Pete broke it off with Judy. And when he said he was done, he meant it. But jealous Judy had to have the last word. Sorry, but it's over. We know that Pete taught Judy how to shoot, but he didn't teach her how to rid the gun of evidence, and he didn't teach her how to clean blood spatter. As a factory worker, Judy was strong enough to drag Pete's body into the garage where she waited for her daughter to go to school. Bye, Mom. Bye, sweetie. After that, she loaded Pete's body into the truck, drove the Blythe, dropped him God knows where in the desert, and returned and left the car three miles from the residence. She made it back home just in time to play the worried girlfriend role, desperate to find her man. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, for the murder of Pete Terrio, and for depriving his family and loved ones, of the closure they desperately deserve. The defendant, Judy Vallott, deserves to spend the rest of her life behind bars. Unfortunately for Pete's family, it takes three trials for Judy's fate to be decided. The first trial, she was found guilty. It was overturned, and there was a new trial. A second trial in 2004 ends in a hung jury. The final trial begins in 2005. Judy was adamant that she didn't do it and that Pete cheated on her, despite all of the evidence. Finally, the third jury renders their verdict. I understand the jury has reached a verdict. Yes, it has, Your Honor. On account of murder in the second degree, how does the jury find the defendant? Guilty. Ms. Fallot, you will now be held pending your sentencing date. Judy is convicted of second degree murder and given 15 years to life. Judy Vallott was sent to prison in the state of California where she's still serving time and hopefully will until she finally admits what she did and tells authorities where the body was because the family deserves that. At the very least, they deserve to have a marker or a grave where they can go and visit Pete Terrio. This is a good man and his, his greatest sin, he just picked the wrong woman to date. He opened his heart and his home, not just to Judy, but to Judy and her daughter. And instead of adoring him and appreciating him, she literally threw him out, discarded him in the desert like a piece of trash. In the history of men that have been killed for suspected affairs, he may be the only one that really didn't do it.